with that being said, Dr. Nasser, over to you to introduce our schedule for the evening. Sure. Thank you, Albert. Uh, Gary, are you ready? Yes, I am. Glorified art thou, O Lord, my God. I give thee thanks inasmuch as thou hast called me into being in thy days and infuse into me thy love and thy knowledge. I beseech thee by thy name, whereby the goodly pearls of thy wisdom and thine utterance were brought forth out of the treasuries of the hearts of such of thy servants as are nigh unto thee, and through which the day star of thy name, the compassionate, have shed its radiance upon all that are in thy heaven and on thy earth to supply me by thy grace and bounty with thy wondrous and hidden bounties. These are the earliest days of my life, O my God, which are, hast, thou hast linked with thine own days. Now that thou hast conferred upon me so great an honor, withhold not from me the things that hast ordained for thy chosen ones. I am, O my God, but a tiny seed, which thou hast sown in the soil of thy love and caused to spring forth by the hand of thy bounty. This seed craveth, therefore, in its inmost being for the waters of thy mercy and the living fountain of thy grace. Send down upon it from the heaven of thy lovely, loving kindness that which will enable it to flourish beneath thy shadow and within the borders of thy court. Thou art he who watereth the hearts of all that have recognized thee from thy plenteous stream and the fountain of thy living waters. Praise be God, the Lord of the worlds. Thank you. Thank you so much. Kim, are you ready? Is Tim unmuted, uh, Albert? He's not. Uh, not. There we go. Okay. They whom God hath endued with insight will readily recognize that the precepts laid down by God constitute the highest means for the maintenance of order in the world and the security of its peoples. He that turneth away from them is accounted among the abject and foolish. We verily have commanded you to refuse the dictates of your evil passions and corrupt desires, and not to transgress the bounds which the pen of the Most High hath fixed, for these are the breath of life unto all created things. The seas of divine wisdom and divine utterance have risen under the breath of the breeze of the All-Merciful. Hasten to drink your fill, O men of understanding, that they have violated the covenant of God by breaking his commandments and have turned back on their heels. These have erred grievously in the sight of God, the all-possessing, the Most High. O ye peoples of the world, know assuredly that my commandments are the lamps of my loving providence among my servants and the keys of my mercy for my creatures. Thus hath it been sent down from the heaven of the will of your Lord, the Lord of Revelation. Were any man to taste the sweetness of the words which the lips of the all-merciful have willed to utter, he would, though the treasures of the earth be in his possession, renounce them one and all, that he might vindicate the truth of even one of his commandments shining above the day spring of his bountiful care and loving kindness. Well, thank you. Thank you so much, Tim. Uh, before David to introduce our speaker, I have to share with you, friends, that uh, my wife put this announcement in our neighborhood and for past two, three firesides several times, uh, over 350 people liked it and uh, commented, about the, the speakers and the talk. For much ado, uh, David, are you ready? Yes. 
So, dear friends, it is my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Mikhail Sergeev, who has a PhD in philosophy of religions from Temple University in Philadelphia. He is an historian of religion, a philosopher, and a writer, and he teaches the history of religions, philosophy, and contemporary art at the University of Arts in Philadelphia. From 2017 to 2021, he served as the co-chair of the Department of Religion, Philosophy, and Theology at the Wilmette Institute. He has also authored over 200 scholarly, journalistic, and creative works, which he published and presented in nine countries, including the United States, Canada, Japan, Poland, Greece, the Czech Republic, the Netherlands, Uzbekistan, and Russia. Along with his scholarly papers, he has written and edited 12 books, including one entitled Theory of Religious Cycles, Tradition, Modernity, and the Baha'i Faith. His latest book is entitled Russian Philosophy in the 21st Century, an Anthology. So, dear friends, please welcome the extremely accomplished Dr. Mikhail Sergeev. Yeah, uh, Albert is not uh, uh, he's uh, still muted. Oh, I see. I see. Now okay, thank okay. you. Thank you. Thank you for this wonderful introduction. The, do you hear me? Fine. Yes, is my sound yes, okay? Everything is fine. Beautiful. So I would like to uh, use the PowerPoint. So, so I will share the screen. <clears throat> And uh, we'll try to make it uh, uh, try to make a slideshow. Yes. So, uh, am I seeing what I'm seeing? Baha'i faith in Russia history and current situation. Yes, indeed, yeah, perfectly. Yes. Um, so, the on on the right side of the slide, you you see the first Baha'i temple in Ashgabat, right? Yes, indeed. Okay. Very good. So I will begin my presentation, <laughs> and first, uh, let me start by telling you why uh, I got interested in the topic. As you all know, Russia is going through another of its um, dramatic or even tragic phases uh, of its history. Now that Russia uh, started uh, a war against Ukraine, and uh, I was communicating with Russian Baha'is, but with not such intensity uh, as I am communicating now. Uh, I uh, thought uh, that um, it is during those uh, crucial moments and tragic moments of history that uh, uh, we should rise um, beyond them and do something uh, to... Um, preserve the history of the faith, um, well, in this case, in my homeland. So that's why uh, I keep researching uh, for a year already. Um, and I'm collecting various materials from my Russian Baha'i friends uh, on various subjects um, related to the history of Baha'i faith in Russia. And uh, maybe you know, who knows, but maybe in the future I will try to make uh, a documentary, a feature documentary about uh, uh, Baha'i faith in Russia and its history uh, based on my interviews that I conducted with uh, some of the Baha contemporary Baha'i scholars, uh, mostly in St. Petersburg, I should say. Um, so those interviews um, are um, the main source uh, of my presentation today, and I would like to uh, first to introduce you uh, to my sources uh, and to the people um, with whom I conducted, actually conducted those interviews. So the first one, Yuli Ioannisyan, uh, who is probably uh, the most competent um, and the most um, scholarly, accomplished uh, Baha'i person um, in the whole Russia now. Um, strangely enough, he became a Baha'i not because of his profession, and uh, 
Um, he is a professional orientalist. Uh, he is um, a um, specialist in uh, Iranian language um, and um, was doing that um, before he became a Baha'i. Um, he became a Baha'i after his meeting with the late William Hatcher in St. Petersburg. And since then, he explores the role Russia played in the history of the Baha'i faith back from its earliest stage. Um, the thing is that um, you know, when Russia was uh, the Tsarist Empire back in the 19th century, the capital of the empire was St. Petersburg. And um, since Russia and uh, Iran, Persia, uh, are very close, uh, and uh, Russian authorities uh, were very attentive to what is was happening back then in Persia, uh, the uh, diplomatic mission of Russia um, was um, was always uh, in search of knowledge about the recent developments in all spheres of Iranian life, including religion. Um, and so it happened that uh, those diplomats, those Russian diplomats, um, from the middle of the 19th century until the end of the 19th century, and even later, uh, reported um, and brought, sent all the documents that they've been able to find to St. Petersburg. So it so happens that um, uh, St. Petersburg archives uh, are now holding the largest collection uh, of materials about Baha'i faith. Um, and Yuli is doing his research trying to, uh, you know, translate uh, the original text from uh, Persian into Russian. And he also wrote a book um, in English about those archives. Um, so um, I uh, spoke with him uh, about his research and especially uh, about uh, Russian scholars of the 19th century. Um, who uh, were doing uh, uh, the same kind of research, but were actually pioneering um, with translations um, and uh, publication of uh, those early Baha'i manuscripts. Uh, the second person I would like to mention is Olga Mehti, uh, who now lives in Voronezh, um, in one of the Russian cities. Uh, but she was born in Ashgabat, uh, one year after uh, the uh, infamous earthquake that uh, took place in 1948. And uh, as she told me, the city was rapidly recovering, um, um, and uh, she was growing up constantly and with interest, asking um, uh, everyone who had survived and seen the former uh, Ashgabat. Uh, so she got interested in the first um, Baha'i temple that actually survived uh, the earthquake, but was significantly damaged. Um, so um, as she um, is saying, the walls of the world's first temple remained intact. Uh, but um, later, the Bolsheviks uh, actually um, destroyed the temple. But it so happened that uh, she came to know that it was her grandfather who had built the temple. Um, and uh, she got interested in the story of the uh, Ashkabat Baha'i community. Uh, she has done a lot of research um, on this topic. She visited Iran, she visited Yazd, um, uh, from which his, uh, her grandfather um, mm -hmm. had come to Ashkabat. Uh, so uh, it's almost first-hand experience uh, of uh, what she um, was telling me. And um, the third person uh, that I wanted uh, to introduce to you, want you to know about, is Elena Mitnik. She uh, is a Baha'i who worked as an editor. Uh, one second, my mouse is not working. Who, who worked as an editor publisher uh, for ten, uh, for sorry, for twenty years, um, in the Baha'i uh, publishing house, 
uh, you, you, she translates it as the unification publishing house, or maybe it's not her, but uh, you know the Deep L translation. I would call it uh, the Unity Publishing House. And for many years, she has been exploring the life and literary works of Isabella Grinevskaya, um, uh, who was a translator, critic, poet, writer, and playwright of the late 19th century. So she is known uh, for her two most significant works, the dramatic uh, poem, uh, The Bob, um, that she wrote in 1903, and the poem tragedy, Beha Ullah. That's how um, they spelled uh, the name uh, Baha'u'llah in Russian back then. Um, so those two plays were devoted to the key moments of the history of the faith. Um, and um, she, um, I mean, uh, Grinevska later um, visited um, Abdul Baha um, and spoke to him, <clears throat> spoke to him. And uh, Abdul Baha gave her uh, permission to actually, uh, well, uh, to uh, keep this plays uh, since later um, it was issued the prohibition to uh, write any literary work in which the founders of, the, of any faith uh, would be present as main characters. So she is the only exception from this rule. And uh, after that brief introduction into my sources, I would start with um, the middle of the 19th century, with the times of Baha'u'llah himself. And I would briefly talk about two czars. The first one, Tsar Alexander II, um, <clears throat> one of those leaders of the world back then to whom Baha'u'llah addressed his epistles. And uh, um, Baha'is know that Tsar was uh, one uh, among those recipients, uh, but they may not know who he was and what was his uh, fate, tragic fate, actually. Uh, Tsar Alexander II, uh, who was also the emperor of Russia, um, uh, was... Um, what is what is the word? Uh, he was um, infuriated uh, by the unfavorable to Russia outcome of the Crimean War. And when he became uh, the Tsar in 1855, uh, well, one year before the end of the Crimean War, uh, he realized that Russia uh, remains a backward country and has to be um, has to be reformed in order to get it more modern and more Western. So when Alexander uh, II uh, came to the throne, he initiated a program of domestic reforms. And in Russian history, this Tsar is known as the Liberator Tsar, because in 1861, uh, he emancipated the Serbs. Uh, for uh, Russia, this event uh, was equal in importance to uh, the end of slavery in the United States, uh, because uh, Russian serfs, um, they were not, formally speaking, they were not slaves, but in actuality, um, they were almost uh, slaves. And Alexander uh, II was able to um, basically emancipate them in 1861. That was his probably um, most uh, celebrated uh, action. Also, he um, initiated a series of other reforms, among them the judicial reform. He introduced uh, local self-governing assemblies known as Zemstvos because he wanted uh, the participation of the people in governmental affairs. He uh, also introduced a military reform um, in order to have um, a um, regular army, established conscription, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Uh, so all in all, uh, Tsar Alexander II is is remembered in Russian history as the good Tsar. tsar. Uh, so uh, hold on a second. Let me change the slide. Um, so in 1852, even before those reforms, 
and at the height of the persecution of the Babis, um, when Baha'u'llah then imprisoned and was facing reprisals and the death penalty, a representative of the Russian diplomatic mission in Tehran uh, extended his helping hand and um, helped uh, Baha'u'llah to be released from prison. And in the epistle, epistle to the Russian Tsar, and we have to say that in 1852, actually, uh, Alexander II uh, was not a Tsar yet. He, he became a Tsar in 1855. Uh, but anyway, in the epistle to the Russian Tsar, the founder of the new religion wrote about this episode. I quote, whilst I lay chained and fettered in the prison, one of the ministers extended me his aid. Wherefore hath God ordained for thee a station which the knowledge of none can comprehend except his knowledge. Beware lest thou barter away this sublime station. And in the epistle to the Russian Tsar, Baha'u'llah continues, Beware lest, uh, lest thy sovereignty withhold thee from he who is the supreme sovereign. Arise thou amongst men in the name of this all-compelling cause, and summon then the nations into God, the exalted, the great. Um, well, you can uh, read the quotations, uh, but um, Alexander uh, did not respond to the to the epistles, and he did not did not uh, become a Baha'i. He got no interest in the Baha'i faith but he was trying to reform his nations, his nation. However, um, while trying to reform Russia, while trying to modernize Russia, um, he released political prisoners, accepted Western style culture and technology, but stopped short of establishing the parliament as the people's representative and decision-making assembly or institution. Um, and in 1866, there was an assassination on his life. And after this failed assassination attempt, Alexander II turned to conservatism and rep repressions, repressive policies. His reactionary policies brought in turn the resurgence of revolutionary terrorism. And when uh, in March of 1881, the Tsar finally decided to convene uh, the parliament, and ratify the first Russian constitution, he already signed the decree. But precisely on that day, while he was going to announce his decision, he was assassinated by the members of the revolutionary terrorist organization, People's Will. And so Russia remained a, an autocracy, a monarchy. Uh, the next Tsar, the Tsar Alexander III, who came uh, after his father uh, became the emperor of Russia in 1881. And um, the rule of Alexander III was very different. He was very reactionary. He established the policy known as counter reforms. He reversed many liberal initiatives of his father, Alexander II. And under the influence of a Russian statesman and advisor to the Tsar, Konstantin Pobedonostsev, Alexander III was against any political or social changes that challenged his autocratic power. Now, on the bright side. On the bright side, Russia fought no significant wars during his tenure. So Alexander III uh, is remembered as the peacemaker. Plus, uh, during the reign of Alexander III, Baha'is in Ashgabat, then part of the Russian Empire, enjoyed equal protection under the law among with other, uh, along with other inhabitants uh, of the state. And it was evidenced by the construction of the first Baha'i temple in Akhabad and by the impartial investigation of the murder of one Baha'i by the Shia fanatics, resulting in the severe sentencing of the murderers. Now, the importance of this event is that for the first time, and I quote here from Yuli Ioannisen, is that for the first time in Baha'i history, a fair trial organized by the Russian 
authorities over the murderers of a Baha'i martyr in Ashgabat confirmed the independent character of the Baha'i religion from Islam at the legal level. Uh, during the trial that took place in 1889, the Russian authorities for the first time in Baha'i history in Russia or elsewhere did not regard the new religion um, as an Islamic heresy or reformist, reformist movement. And this was evidenced, uh, and I quote here from Yuli, by the fact that unlike Muslims, Sunnis, and Shiites uh, swore on or oath on the Quran for all in court without exception, for Baha'is who participated in the trial as witnesses, the Quran oath was replaced by another procedure. Uh, end of quote. And here is another one. The murderers had been sentenced to death, but at the request of the Baha'is themselves, this was commuted to community service, as was also reported in the Russian press. So what was Baha'u'llah's reaction uh, to those events? He wrote another letter uh, to Tsar Alexander III. And frankly, uh, I cannot find this letter in English. Um, I found the translation of this letter, uh, which is um, in St. Petersburg. It was translated in, from Persian into, or from Arabic, I, I don't remember, into Russian um, by Alexander Tumansky. Uh, and uh, it was cited by Yuri Ionesian uh, in his uh, articles. Uh, so therefore, I take some portions from this letter. And this is my personal translation into English. So uh, please, uh, it is not official. It is not authoritative. Um, uh, many English speaking people probably never or, or never read this letter. Um, so um, among other things, um, Baha'u'llah writes in his epistle to the community of Ashgabat, uh, truly the shining power, meaning Russia, uh, may God strengthen it, has shown justice. This help of the power of light, this demonstration of truth and justice, God willing, will erase the tyranny and violence of the world. To this community, we bequeath that it will not forget the, this justice, and that from the depth of its heart, it will pray to God that he may continue and prolong with the longevity of power and kingship the exploits of him who holds the banner of justice for God alone designed to help those oppressed by all and decreed a just verdict. And this is the first aid which has been given to these oppressed, thanks to the will of the greatest emperor and the most honorable general, may almighty God strengthen them both. So it, it's quite interesting for me that um, to Alexander II, who would later become the great reformer uh, of uh, Russian in Russian history, uh, Baha'u'llah wrote a letter that was quite um, not harsh but uh, strong. Uh, although he thanked him for helping, um, but still, um, it was not as um, it was not as uh, I don't know what word to use as as night right uh, as um, nice and approving as Bahá'u'lláh wrote uh, to uh, the Queen of England, maybe because Russia was still an autocracy, uh, but to the Tsar Alexander the Third, who was actually a reactionary, and um, stopped many liberal policies that had been initiated by his father, um, Bahá'u'lláh wrote. Uh, a, a much nicer letter, um, probably because uh, he was impressed uh, with the just and fair trial. Now, uh, let's move on to Leo Tolstoy, because when it uh, comes to Baha'is in Russia, um, people usually talk about uh, Leo Tolstoy. And uh, yes, um, Lev Nikolaevich Tolstoy, or Count Leo Tolstoy, as he is known in the English-speaking world, uh, was a person who was greatly interested uh, in the Baha'i faith. 
back in the end of the 19th century and in the beginning of the 20th century. Um, I'm not going to tell you who Tolstoy was. Uh, he's universally acclaimed as one of the greatest authors who ever lived. Um, but in, in the 1870s, and he was born in 1828, so in, in his 50s, Tolstoy underwent a profound spiritual crisis, which he described in his essay, A Confession. Now, Tolstoy was my favorite writer, probably still is my favorite writer, but he, he was my favorite writer when I was in my 20s, so I've read a lot of Tolstoy, including um, not only his literary works, but his theological works and his um, diaries. Um, Tolstoy, when he uh, went through this spiritual crisis, completely uh, changed his worldview, cursed his literary activity, um, studied Hebrew and ancient Greek, uh, produced his own translation of the New Testament, um, and uh, created his own brand of Christianity, which is known um, for his formula, non-resistance non to evil by force. Uh, so his idea of nonviolent resistance, which he articulated in such books as The Kingdom of God is Within You, uh, those ideas had a deep impact on Gandhi and Martin Luther King Jr., among others. Now, as for Baha'i faith, Tolstoy first heard about the Babis in 1884. Um, and these, uh, by the way, are quotes from another very useful article that I found um, in Russian language. It is not translated. It is an article by Nancy Ackerman and Graham Hassel. Nancy Ackerman uh, was a Canadian, Canadian pioneer into Russia and lived there for about 15 years. She is now back to Canada. Um, so that's um, what she writes about uh, Tolstoy's encounter with the Baha'i faith. So he first heard about the Babis in 1884, and in the correspondence and diaries um, of the writer for 16 years, one can find statements about the doctrines of the Babis and later Baha'is. Um, Tolstoy's attitude toward the new religion was ambiguous. and. Um, uh, it is not stated um, in the article in detail why, but I can, exp I can explain why. Tolstoy was a typical Enlightenment type thinker. In other words, um, for him, reason was uh, autonomous and self-sufficient. And um, he was searching for the truth, but he was pretty sure that if Jesus uh, had not found this truth before him, Tolstoy himself, he would, he would have found the same truth. In other words, Tolstoy um, did not um, recognize uh, the concept of uh, the manifestation of God um, in the high faith or the concept of prophecy in Judaism, um, the differences, the differences uh, in quality between uh, the founders of religions and other people. Um, and maybe that's why he was not um, able to accept this religion in full. However, um, he uh, was very interested in the teaching itself. Um, of course, he was lacking knowledge back in the end of the 19th century. Uh, and yes, his own philosophical views were uh, inconsistent, but consistent with his own Enlightenment type uh, perspectives. Um, so sometimes uh, this led uh, him to reject the faith, um, and sometimes he actually ex expressed great admiration for uh, the teachings. Um, Abdul Baha knew, and here is uh, these are the quotes from another book by Standardo uh, about Tolstoy and the Baha'i faith. Abdul Baha knew that Tolstoy was interested in the faith, and he advised Baha'is living in Russian territory uh, to maintain contact with him and to supply Tolstoy with reliable information. And that's what was done. Um, it, it was reported that Tolstoy was planning to write a book 
about the Babi and Baha'i movement. Um, in 1902, uh, he received a personal letter from Abdul Baha, which said in part, I quote, act so that your name may leave a good memory in the world of religion. Many philosophers have come and each raised a flag, say five meters, but you have raised the flag 10 meters. Immerse yourself in the ocean of unity and gain the Lord's help forever. Uh, in 1902, uh, when Tolstoy was asked about uh, Baha'u'llah and his cause, uh, he so, um, reportedly uh, replied, how can I deny it? It is obvious that this cause will win over the whole world. Uh, but I have to say that uh, Count Leo Tolstoy was very, uh, he, he was from an aristocratic family, family and he was very well um, taught and educated and very polite. Um, so th those kind of sentences, I think, should not be taken as Tolstoy accepting fully the teaching. Uh, he was simply polite and um, emphasizing the universal character of the teachings. Uh, toward the end uh, of his life, as Ackerman and Hassel write, Tolstoy concluded that the teachings of the Bab developed in the writings of Baha'u'llah were the highest and purest form of religion. And in 1910, shortly before his death, uh, he wrote of the Baha'i faith very profound. I know of no other faith that is so deep. And of course, these kind of sentences are already beyond politeness uh, because uh, Tolstoy writes them in his diary. And uh, this is not simply a response to uh, someone, um, uh, any person, who wants to know his opinion, but this is the expression of his personal thought. So um, from this, I would conclude that Tolstoy um, was quite sincere in his interest and appreciation of the Baha'i teachings. Now, some words about uh, the scholarly studies of the Baha'i faith in Russia in the 19th century. Uh, the uh, center character here is Baron Victor Rosen, uh, who was the academician of, of the St. Petersburg Academy of Sciences, professor and dean of the Faculty of Oriental Languages at St. Petersburg Univers uh, University. Uh, he left uh, behind him detailed descriptions of many Babis and Baha'i manuscripts now preserved in the Institute of Eastern Manuscripts of the Russian Academy of Sciences. Uh, his descriptions are illustrated with lengthy, lengthy excerpts uh, from the texts. Now, the difference between Rosen and, uh, let's say, the English, the famous English scholar um, um, Brownie, uh, Edward Brownie, I think, was that um, the English scholar was concentrating on um, personal meetings and history of the movement, while Russian scholars were concentrating on finding uh, the actual texts, uh, the scriptures, um, and uh, trying to, to produce translations. And by the way, um, they worked independently uh, of the uh, English scholar first. Only later, uh, Tumansky, who was the, uh, the disciple of Rosen, uh, established uh, communication with Dr. Brownie. Uh, but before that, there was no communication. So therefore, uh, all the materials, all the texts, all the translations, um, all the notes uh, were uh, done uh, independently. And that actually makes the value of those documents quite high. So Rosen has translated into Russian and published several Baha'i scriptures, including the Glad Tidings. Uh, he also prepared for publication the collection of messages of the founder of the Baha'i religion, consisting of original texts in Arabic and Persian. Uh, and uh, Alexander Tumansky, I was not able to find his portrait, unfortunately. So what you see is the cover page of his first ever translation of uh, the Most Holy Book into any um, European language, Russian. 
Uh, Tomalski was born in 1861, was a student of Rosen. Um, and um, his main accomplishment was the first translation into Russian language of the mother book of the Baha'i religion, Kitab i Agdas. Um, I do have this translation, by the way. It is available in Russian nowadays on the internet. And it's very interesting to see uh, this pre-revolutionary translation and the differences in language. Um, it's quite, interest, quite interesting. He published it with his original commentaries. Um, Tumalski also published the Will and Testament of Baha'u'llah in the original and in translation, as well as several other. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sarkif. Uh, this is, uh, uh, I should share this with the friends tonight. One of the blessings of this fireside is that I have come across some very, very special people that I feel that I'm very close to. And one of them is Mikhail, really, for lots of reasons. You know, I have to tell you, for lots of reasons. Uh, for example, the picture that he showed about Yuli, he gave two firesides in our house while he was living in Silver Spring, Maryland with his yeah. wife. Uh, I'm sure Yuli knows. Late wife. Late wife. A late wife, yeah. What an angel she was, really. And when you put her, his picture, you know, touched my heart again and said, oh my God, you know, what a story. And you showed some pictures of uh, people of the National Spiritual Assembly of uh, Russia that her sister still lives in the, this uh, Northern Virginia, you know. Uh, and uh, History is such a thing that it has, it is a sweet and also is a very painful uh, when you see uh, people that you know and they are no longer with you, etc., etc. Uh, Hajar is from Azerbaijan. I don't know, Miss uh, Memandova is. Uh, do you want to say something? Because uh, she was she became Baha'i with one of these people that you. Uh, I think showed the picture, if I'm not mistaken. Hajar, are you? Uh, could you, uh, Albers, could you unmute uh, Miss Hajar? Do you see that, Hajar? Uh, do you see that, uh, Albers? Are you here? Okay, do you see Hajar? Hi. Yes. Uh, uh, Hajar, go yeah, ahead. I, uh, good evening. I just want to tell you, I recognize the picture of the, um, uh, not the last one, but before the last one. It was mm -hmm. man, this woman standing. Um, That's right. He was holding Baha'i. Yeah, and uh, his name was uh, Wahid Hazi. Mm -hmm. And he was uh, pioneering in Azerbaijan, in Baku, for uh, more than four years. Mm -hmm. So his family moved to Iran when he was four years old. And then when he was 64 years old, he came back to Baku and was pioneering there. And he was, he was the, um, he was the main uh, reason I became Baha'i because, uh, so it, because uh, right now, like we have a Baha'i community in Baku. Hmm. Well, By the way, the, the woman, the woman who was holding the sign, I think she's still alive. She's ninety-nine. I don't know the woman. I know uh, Sham, Shamsi, Shamsi Hanum. Shamsi, Shamsi Hanum. Yeah, yeah. I, I was told that she's alive. I wanna, I wanna take an, yeah. in, uh, <laughs> take an interview with her. Yes, yes, she's yeah. very <laughs> special, uh, and her sister is in Northern Virginia, and she's a scholar, etc. And tonight we are really uh, lucky. We have, uh, I mean, uh, we have lots of scholars here. I mean, Dr. Sh Shola Quinn, uh, she is historian and also scholar in many ways. Uh, she's here tonight. But I want, before I go to all this detail, I just want to thank you so much, so much for your scholarly and uh, most interesting presentation about the Baha'is in Russia that I have heard myself. 
uh, I have known many people that they came to Iran after Bolshevik Revolution and they had gone even to Siberia. You know, Kamalov, Dr. Kamalov is one of those. He was a friend of my father and he had a fireside with my, he would come to my father's fireside. It's an amazing story. But I don't want to take your time. I'm going to uh, pass it to Albors and go to quick uh, question and answers. <clears throat> Yes, and I, I, we appreciate this uh, fireside presentation very much. It was very enlightening. We do have a number of questions coming through in the chat as I read them right here. Uh, the first was about Tolstoy. And you mentioned that you were a very avid reader of Tolstoy. Um, is there anything within his writings beyond what you've shared here, um, especially in his later writings as he became more familiar with the faith that shows a Baha'i theme? And if you are someone who is interested in the Baha'i faith um, or who's familiar with it, is there anything in particular that he's written that seems to, you know, follow Baha'i principles? Uh, thank you for the question. Uh, look, when I was um, reading Tolstoy, I was 20 years old. Uh, and it so happened, I was 21. Um, I was an intern uh, in the uh, Soviet newspaper Pravda, The Truth. Mm -hmm. And uh, since we all knew, you know, the Soviet people joked that there is no truth in in the in Pravda, in in the, in the newspaper Truth. Uh, so there was nothing there for me to do, and I discovered that in their library they have ninety volumes of Tolstoy's work. Um, and it was there that uh, I got myself acquainted with his diaries uh, and his later writings. But back then. I had no knowledge of the Baha'i faith. So therefore, number one, I cannot say about Tolstoy and Baha'is um, based on that reading. Number two, uh, what was most uh, amazing to me after having read Tolstoy's diaries was that the man suffered from uh, teeth pain. Every other day he would write, my teeth are in pain, I want to kill myself every other day, really. And uh, she, I, I kind of remember it. And since then, I always tell my students that uh, you cannot understand Russian literature until you experience, and unless you experience pain in your teeth. Uh, of course, with modern American uh, dentistry, you never do that. Uh, anesthesia works miracles. Uh, but, uh, you know, uh, I think it's very important. Now, as for Tolstoy um, and Baha'i faith, I think what um, attracted Tolstoy in Baha'i faith was its universal spirit, because Tolstoy was a universalist. Uh, he was never Russian nationalist. He, he got converted to orthodoxy, but he didn't like uh, uh, these uh, limitations uh, or nationalistic spirit of this kind of thing. And he got um, expelled from the church um uh, uh as a result uh so what always attracted me to tolstoy was uh his um independent search for truth and universalist aspirations and i think these two things uh that would make tolstoy very close uh to the baha'i faith mm. we appreciate that we appreciate that very much <clears throat> You know, speaking uh, to the rest of your talk and, of course, to your own background, right, is there a reason that so many of the early Russian Baha'is were scholars? Is this something that was being discussed within the scholarly circles and it just so happened to be the case that so many people were interested in it? You know, why were so many learned people attracted to the faith, even if it is just your opinion? Mm. Uh, look, uh, number one, um, Russia always had uh, a very solid scholarly school of Oriental studies. Uh, Persia was nearby, and um, uh, Russia always had a Muslim population. Uh, so therefore, uh, Arabic, Persian, you know, all these things always interested Russian scholars. And as you see, um, since the, even in the night back in the 19th century, they had... Uh, very active uh, and uh, engaging scholarly research in this area. So it simply so happened 
uh, that, um, among other things, those scholars uh, got interested um, in, in this new uh, religious movement. Number one. Number two, um, uh, this Orientalist research, I'm pretty sure, was sponsored by the state because um, any new religious movement would have political implications. And uh, uh, for Russia, it was very important to know what kind of political implications that may bring, number two. Number three, uh, Leo Tolstoy, uh, well, was so famous in Russia that uh, people uh, were telling that Russia has two czars, one Nicholas and one Leo, Leo the Great. Uh, so whatever Leo the Great says uh, immediately becomes popular. And Leo Tolstoy was genuinely interested in the Baha'i faith as well as many other things. You know, he was in his 80s, but he had a fresh mind. Um, and um, Tolstoy was interested, everyone else was interested. Um, but not only Tolstoy, some other Russian writers uh, knew about uh, the, the faith. Turgenev, for example, very famous Russian writer, uh, knew about the Babis. Um, so it was not confined. The interest was not confined to scholarship. Um, it was also quite spread among Russian intelligentsia, I would say. Understood. Understood. And of course, as we move forward, I, I, I appreciate you all for your questions tonight. Um, that being said, and this is a difficult topic, so we understand if there aren't many clear answers, but um, how do you feel about the future of the Baha'i faith in Russia, given everything you know? Um, I understand predicting the future is difficult, but even if it is just your sense of the where the faith is going? It will depend on uh, the political situation in the country. So Russia is going through a difficult uh, turn of events, and um, we do not know what will be the end of it. Um, my personal understanding of what will happen is that we are witnessing the end of the Russian Empire the Russian empire that existed for 500 years. Uh, and all empires end in uh, deterioration. And, um, you know, Russia was able to sustain itself after the collapse of the Soviet Union, but the, coll the collapse was uh, not complete. Now we are witnessing the complete collapse of what left of the Soviet Union. So my prediction is that um, Russia will not win the war. My prediction is that Ukraine, with the uh, help of the Western allies, will retake the Crimea. Um, after that, uh, probably Putin will be poisoned or killed by his uh, comrades. Uh, who would who would like uh, obviously to blame everything on Putin? Um, uh, then probably they will organize uh, presidential elections, uh, and then there will be um, something like uh, civil war in Russia. Uh, uh, and the result of the civil war will be um, several states that will be formed uh, where Russia is now formed. And after that, we'll see what happens. I don't, I don't see any bleak future for the Baha'i faith in Russia, but we'll see what kind of Russia we are going to have. Uh, so if Russia is a normal European country with a democratic government, great. You know, I think uh, Baha'i faith has a lot of potentials there. And uh, you know what will happen in Siberia or Ural Mountains or uh, somewhere else, that would be... Uh, another story. But now the situation is so grave that um, Baha'is asked me, the person who uh, was the representative, well, I will not name anyone. Uh, I would say that Baha'is asked me not to, pub not to publish videos in Russian about the Baha'i faith on my YouTube channel, because my YouTube channel contains some videos which may be construed by the Russian government in a negative way. And as a result, Baha'i community may be designated, uh, you know, uh, as, a, as a foreign spy or something like this, because nowadays in Russia, you can get into prison for uh, reposting on Facebook. 
Um, so therefore, I uh, basically eliminated all my videos, all my videos about Baha'i faith in Russia. Well, we appreciate that very much. Um, and I'm sure there are going to be a number of questions that we forward to you privately, given that sensitivity. Uh, the community tonight is very interested in speaking with you um, and, and uh, in helping the community in Russia and that is leaving Russia uh, as uh, the situation develops. That being said, Dr. Nasser, we are out of questions. Back over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Albert. Uh, Gary, could you prepare a prayer for closing? Also, while I'm thanking uh, other people that they are here tonight, really. Uh, I really appreciate Dr. Serkif very much, very much for really, truly a scholarly presentation that you made. And you can be sure that I will call you. And you are so gracious. I thank you from the bottom of my heart. You know, uh, certain people I call and they don't refuse. There are several of them are here right now. Uh, and I appreciate that very much. Uh, so, Gary, are you ready? Uh, Albers, could you? Un yeah, yeah, yes. Fine. Okay. Okay. Thou safe unto me, O my God, the full measure of thy love and thy good pleasure, and through the attractions of thy resplendent light, enrapture our hearts. O thou who art the supreme evidence and the all glorified, send down upon me as a token of thy grace, thy vitalizing breezes throughout the daytime and in the night season, O Lord of bounty. No deed have I done, O my God, to merit beholding thy face. And I know of a certainty that were I to live as long as the world lasts, I would fail to accomplish any deed such as to deserve this favor. Inasmuch as the station of a servant shall ever fall short of access to thy holy precincts, unless thy bounty should reach me and thy tender mercy pervade me and thy loving kindness encompass me. All praise unto thee, O thou besides whom there is no other God, graciously enable me to ascend unto thee and to be granted the honor of dwelling in thy nearness and to have communion with thee alone. No God is there but thee. Indeed, shouldst thou desire to confer a blessing upon a servant, Thou wouldst blot out from the realm of his heart every mention or disposition except thy own mention. And shouldst thou ordain evil for a servant by reason of that which his hands have unjustly wrought before thy face, thou wouldst test him with the benefits of this world and of the next, that he might become preoccupied therewith and forget thy remembrance. Thank you so much. Mm. Albors? Ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the end of our scheduled program. It is time that we stop the recording.